Hello there, my name is Wes, and this is a why do it and how to video for my breakout box mod for Chase Bliss effects pedals. We're going to be replacing the dip switches on the back of the pedal with some tweezer free toggle switches so you can really get in there and use those controls. This video is not affiliated or sponsored in any way, I just wanted to share some design files and a bit of how to on a mod that's really improved my quality of life when dealing with these pedals. I'm going to briefly overview what the dip switches actually do and why the mod is worthwhile, but if you want to skip to the build tutorial, just go to whatever timestamp I've added here in post. Okay, so these little switches are powerful and totally worth using, but you can see even in the official Chase Bliss instructional videos that it's a little awkward to use them even under the best of circumstances. Um, first we're going to, um, I think I also had trails on, I just accidentally put trails on. And who designed this with the dip switches so close together, my goodness. If you're holding your guitar in your hands and hunching over a velcroed pedal board, any fine tune adjustments to those switches are going to be a non-starter, at least for me. So these pedals are awesome, but to justify the premium pricing, again, at least in my case, the value is only really there if I'm utilizing those extended controls and making use of the MIDI program slots, and you can see my previous video for more on how to connect up that way. Without that stuff, I feel like I can get something that'll do similar work for a lot less money. So what do the switches actually do? Well, they are cool. On the CB pedals that I'm familiar with, the switches let you assign up to five parameters to an additional modulation source. That source can be either an expression pedal input or an additional digital LFO, which runs totally independently from the LFO that would be on the front panel. So that extra LFO can be configured to loop like a normal LFO or to one shot, more like an envelope, which triggers upon activation of the effect. As somewhat of a synthesizer nerd, I found the explanation of the dip switch functions to be pretty confusing because the instruction manual proposes new language for a lot of things, rather than using the existing terms that are already part of the synth lexicon. So instead of LFO, you have bounce. Instead of envelope, you have ramp and hold. Instead of polarity, you have rise and fall, etc, etc. I think they were trying to make do with limited panel space and make things easier to understand for guitar players who are less initiated into the mysteries of the synth world, but personally I prefer to use the existing nomenclature, and I'm going to relabel and reorganize the controls to make more sense to my brain, and hopefully the brains of other synthesizer nerds and dodge jockeys. Also I get more panel space to work with with the mod, so hopefully that helps. Okay, so enough about what and why with this mod, let's talk about how to actually build it. For this project, you will need the following 10 things. Number one, a 3D printer to make the box, or you'll at least need to find or build in some other way, an enclosure that'll be of the right size. Number two, you're gonna need some of that special printer paper that's used for making stickers. I can't write that small and neat, so we're gonna do a nice paper face panel for this one. Number three, a soldering iron and solder. Now if you're getting nervous, don't worry. You're not gonna be soldering connections on the pedal itself. You're only gonna be soldering connections in the breakout box and the connections to the pedal itself will be solder free. Number four, 16 sub mini SPST toggle switches. At 89 cents a whack, these are gonna be the most expensive part of the mod. Uh, to do this mod on three pedals, it costs 43 bucks, plus you need a few extras in case one of them breaks or is a dud or something. Number five, wire to connect the switches in the box to the circuit board in the pedal. I used 22 gauge solid core copper wire. Definitely don't try it with stranded core unless you're an absolute glutton for punishment. You could definitely use DuPont connectors, just make sure you get the male ones. Number six, you're gonna need basic hand tools. A screwdriver, a drill, needle nose pliers, wire strippers, scissors, an X-Acto knife, a multimeter, a little crescent wrench, and maybe some tweezers. That ought to do ya. I know it seems like a lot, but most of that stuff you'll find in your average household toolkit under your sink. Number seven is optional, but you can insulate the inside of the box with some conductive tape and then ground that tape if you're worried about RF interference coming through the plastic. Number eight, a strip of dual lock to attach the box to the pedal. I chose this method because it's really solid, but it can be removed without damaging the pedal if you want to return it to its stock configuration. Number nine, you'll need some tiny little wood screws to affix the back plate of the breakout box to the rest of the box. Number 10, last but not least, you're going to need acceptance in your heart of the fact that modding your pedal almost certainly voids the warranty. I take no responsibility if you break something, and probably, understandably, neither does Chase Bliss. Links to the products that I use are all going to be in the description, none of them are affiliate links, so I utterly degaff what you choose to buy, but you'll probably want to get the same switches as me if you plan on using the enclosure that I'm providing design files for. With all that stuff in hand, you are ready to go, let's get cracking. So after sketching out the front panel on paper, I popped into Fusion 360 to bang out this design for a 3D printed box that'll stick onto the top of the pedal with dual lock and serve as a home for all those switches. We're going to have the lid open up in the back as well as the bottom because trying to do laparoscopic surgery on this thing through just the bottom would be freaking impossible even if you got small hands like me. 
thank me later. I'll post the STL file on Thingiverse and put a link to that in the description. This is going to be a very easy print. No supports, just a bit of easy bridging. You can use pretty much any color, any material, and any nozzle size you want. Just make sure it doesn't warp too much or it won't fit squarely on the pedal. I chose black because it looks sick, and I chose PETG because I don't really trust PLA for the long term, and I went with an 0.8mm nozzle because I'm a bad boy who prints grainy and because that's what was already on my printer, and there's not that much detail in this model anyway, so whatever's clever. So before moving on, make sure the switches can slide into the holes in the panel without needing to force them, and hog those holes out a little wider with your drill if necessary. Get your mind out of the gutter. You can line the inside with conductive tape if you fancy, and then it's off to create our paper face labels. I'll post a link to the images I created for the Thermae, Gravitas, and Warped Vinyl Mark II, which you can just print out and use without any faffing about, as they say. Uh, if you're going to design a front panel for some other pedal or you don't like the look of mine, you can use the techniques in the following section to create your own. So in Fusion 360, I'm going to get a screenshot of the top of the breakout box while using the inspector tool to display the width of the panel area in millimeters. Then I'm going to hop into GIMP, which stands for GNU Image Manipulation Program. GNU stands, okay, you know what, I'm not going all the way down the rabbit hole on this one, it's a free image editor program. So I'm in here, I'm going to specify the canvas size that matches the dimensions indicated in my screenshot from Fusion 360, and then import said screenshot to serve as a template so I know where all the text goes and where all the holes are going to be. Matching these dimensions now ensures is that when I print the sticker out later, it's going to be the same size and physical meat space as the 3D printed panel that it's stuck to. As for what the labels mean and why the panels are laid out the way they are, I plan to cover the Thermae, Gravitas, and Warped Vinyl individually in future videos with some fun patch ideas and whatnot, so feel free to mush the thing if you want to see that. In the video description, I'll include a diagram of how to remap the dip switches to their new homes on the breakout box. With our sticker labels made, we're going to carefully cut them out and stick them down on the breakout box. Use that X-Acto knife to trim the holes out so our switches can go in there. Once everything's looking nice and neat, you're going to mount all those SPST sub-mini switches in the panel. This can be a little bit tricky, and there are a few things you'll want to make sure of. Make sure the switch bodies are oriented vertically so the switch travels vertically when you flip it and not at some weird diagonal angle. Number two, use your multimeter to make sure that all the switches are oriented the same way. There's only two contacts on the switch, so it's hard to know on site which way is up. You want to make sure that in the up position the contacts are closed and in the down position the contacts are open otherwise the switches will behave counterintuitively at this point in the project you should have your box ready to go with a completed front panel now we need to prep the pedal itself by removing these thingies, the dip switches themselves. You can see that they have little prongs on them which slot into the little sockets that are inside the pedal. We're going to be wiring our toggle switches into the sockets that are now exposed with the removal of these little red Lego bricks. To get the switches out, you can remove the back plate on the pedal and remove the first circuit board and then push the switches out from the inside and then replace the circuit board and close everything back up. However, on a board packed as tight as the Thermae, I just couldn't manage it. So I eventually decided to go medieval on this thing and pry it out directly from the outside, which was honestly less trouble anyway, so it's what I'd recommend probably for all the pedals. I tried a few different ways and eventually just got a solid grip on it with a pair of pliers and wiggled it free. With the sockets exposed, we now want to grab a strip of dual lock, cut it to size, and then stick it to both the pedal and the breakout box so that we can firmly join them together. Dual lock is a bit like Velcro, but it's a lot stronger and more rigid. I try to use it only for semi-permanent applications though, because after being separated and rejoined a few times, the adhesive can start to give out and just come unstuck. So don't stick them together just yet. Now for the most tedious and boring part of the project, unfortunately. We're going to have to cut out a bunch of strips of wire that are going to connect the switches to their destinations within the pedal itself. So we're going to start out by twisting together 16 pairs of wire, one for each switch. You can refer to the diagram to see each one's destination and then eyeball the length. Use a diverse array of colors so you can more easily keep track of what's going where. Again, referring to the diagram, stick all your twisty pairs into their respective sockets. You can use needle nose pliers for this and make sure that they're really firmly seated. So leave all 16 pairs sticking straight out and now we're ready to join the breakout box to the pedal itself. We're going to gently guide the wires through that little window, making sure everything is squared up, and then apply firm even pressure until the dual lock engages with a nice satisfying little clunk. We're approaching the finish line here. We want to start by attaching the shortest connections in the first row and then work our way up to the longer connections in the last row of switches. We start by bending the longer wires out of the way. Make sure to steady the wires that you're bending so that they bend away from the socket. Bending them right at the socket could potentially unseat them and then that'll be a pain to fix. Assuming that you have the pedals facing knobs down with the breakout box pointing away from you, the five rightmost wire pairs will map, in order, to the five closest switches. 
This is the hardest row because it's the most cramped. So bend the leads into place with your needle nose pliers and solder down the connections on the whole row. The next three wire pairs, if we're still moving from right to left, will connect to the back row of switches, so leave them alone for now. The next five wire pairs, again, we're going from right to left, will map, in order, to the five middle switches. So follow the same procedure, hook the leads into place and solder them down. Look at the diagram if you have any questions. Next comes the back row, which connects to your six remaining wire pairs that are still exposed. These don't map over in order and they'll crisscross each other, so make sure that you're double checking the diagram. With those soldered down, you're nearly in the home stretch, but before you affix that back plate, fire up the pedal and use your diagram as a checklist to tick off every switch and make sure that it's functioning as intended. Once you're certain everything's working, just toss a little conductive tape on that back plate if you want and then put it where it needs to go. Drill a couple of pilot holes in the bottom and screw it permanently into place with some tiny little wood screws. With that, my friends, you now have a fully modified Chase Bliss pedal with a breakout box. Uh, you can access those extended controls a lot more easily. Go crazy and have fun. This video is already long enough, so I won't go super in-depth with the new panel layout, but here's a rough overview. The first row of switches dictates whether a given parameter goes on the modulation bus or gets left alone. The second row can only affect parameters that have already been added to the modulation bus. There are polarity switches. So positive means that the parameter goes high when the modulation source goes high, negative means that the relationship is inverted. The third row are global parameters that vary between pedals. More details on that can be found in the product manuals or in the follow-up videos that I'll eventually get to. Subscribe if you want to see those and many other projects that are in the pipeline. I'm a simple man, but who doesn't like to see the number go up? Keep in mind that all these switch settings can be saved to MIDI program slots and then automatically recalled with MIDI program change messages. So doing this mod in combination with a MIDI distribution box, cough cough, see my previous video, can really help you get the most out of the pedal's potential. So if you're considering doing a breakout box mod, I really hope this helps. I've heard from a lot of people who are considering it, but I think I might actually be the first person to post their results, so... Cheers, thank you for watching, and see you next time.